dedication and preface to the adventures of a nature guide this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by sue anderson the adventures of a nature guide by enos mills published in 1920 dedication to elizabeth frayer burnell a nature guide preface the individual interested in the world of outdoors in many sided natural history finds entertainment everywhere in the wilderness through all the seasons storm sunshine night desert stream and forest are crowded with waiting attractions and moving scenes to have the most adventures and the greatest enjoyment in a given time ramble the wilds alone and without a fishing rod or a gun the rambler is free to wander afar and to enjoy the multitude of adventures that come thick and fast upon him the wilderness being the safety zone of the world these experiences are likely to be less dangerous than staying at home the hunter however armed and killing multiplies dangers and in giving his attention to game wanders but little and enjoys less variety and fewer adventures the chapters in this book are filled with the experiences and adventures which came to me as a solitary and unarmed camper in the wilds of the continent these and other experiences together with inheritances not so tangible produced definite results i became a mountain climber and a peak guide in doing this i developed nature guiding that is helping people to become happily acquainted with the life and wonders of wild nature the people of the united states have within the past generation created national parks state parks city parks and made wildlife reservations recognizing their higher values to people for their uses in education recreation and hopefulness i wish that every park had a nature guide and that every wild place might early become a park there now are a number of cabinet positions each with a secretary to control and direct its work but is it not time to have a directory of parks and recreation something for all time and for all people instead of one man directing this there should be a number a board of directors who are directly responsible to the public this should be a department separate from and independent of all cabinet positions and should outrank them a number of these chapters were written especially for this book i appreciate the courtesy of the editors in allowing me to reproduce the articles which appeared in the following magazines snow blinded on the summit and trees at timberline in country life waiting in the wilderness censored natural history news winter mountaineering children of my trail school and thunder and lightning in the saturday evening post a day with a nature guide in the outlook play and pranks of wild folk and naturalist meets prospector in the american boy the white cyclone in outing and wind rapids on the heights in harper's end of preface chapter one of the adventures of a nature guide by enos mills this librivox recording is in the public domain Quote, let the molders of public opinion in the chief subjects usually called humanistic history sociology economics politics ethics religion once they come to see how fundamentally soundness of view and healthfulness of life in all these domains 
are dependent upon correct elementary information about nature and innumerable students of educational problems teachers and public-spirited and philanthropic persons concentrate their thought and ingenuity upon surmounting the practical difficulties in the way of securing the contact with nature which is indispensable to such information and attitude dr william e ritter End quote. chapter one snow blinded on the summit as i climbed up out of the dwarfed woods at timberline in the rocky mountains and started across the treeless white summit the terrific sun glare on the snow warned me of the danger of snow blindness i had lost my snow glasses but the wild attractions of the heights caused me to forget the care of my eyes and i lingered to look down into canyons and to examine magnificent snow cornices a number of mountain sheep also interested me then for half an hour i circled a confiding flock of ptarmigan and took picture after picture through the clear air the sunlight poured with burning intensity i was twelve thousand feet above the sea around me there was not a dark crag nor even a tree to absorb the excess of light a wilderness of high rugged peaks stood about splendid sunlit mountains of snow to east and west they faced winter's noonday sun with great shadow mantles flowing from their shoulders as i started to hurry on across the pass i began to experience the scorching pains that go with seared sunburnt eyes snow blindness unfortunately i had failed to take even the precaution of blackening my face which would have dulled the glare at the summit my eyes became so painful that i could endure the light only a few seconds at a time occasionally i sat down and closed them for a minute or two finally while doing this the lids adhered to the balls and the eyes swelled so that i could not open them blind on the summit of the continental divide i made a grab for my useful staff which i had left standing beside me in the snow in the fraction of a second that elapsed between thinking of the staff and finding it my brain woke up to the seriousness of the situation to the nearest trees it was more than a mile and the nearest house was many miles away across ridges of rough mountains i had matches and a hatchet but no provisions still while well aware of my peril i was only moderately excited feeling no terror less startling incidents have shocked me more narrow escapes from street automobiles have terrified me it had been a wondrous morning the day cleared after a heavy fall of fluffy snow i had snowshoed up the slope through a ragged snow-carpeted spruce forest whose shadows wrought splendid black and white effects upon the shining floor there were thousands of towering slender spruces each brilliantly laden with snow flowers standing soft white and motionless in the sunlight while i was looking at one of these artistically decorated trees a mass of snow dropped upon me from its top throwing me headlong and causing me to lose my precious eye protecting snow glasses but now i was blind with staff in hand i stood for a minute or two planning the best manner to get along without eyes my faculties were intensely awake serious situations in the wilds had more than once before this stimulated them to do their best temporary blindness is a good stimulus for the imagination and the memory in fact is good educational training for all the senses however perilous my predicament during a mountain trip 
the possibility of a fatal ending never even occurred to me looking back now i cannot but wonder at my matter-of-fact attitude concerning the perils in which that snow blindness placed me i had planned to cross the pass and descend into a trail at timberline the appearance of the slope down which i was to travel was distinctly in my mind from my impressions just before darkness settled over me off i slowly started i guided myself with information from feet and staff feeling my way with the staff so as not to step off a cliff or walk overboard into a canyon in imagination i pictured myself following the shadow of a staff bearing and slouch hatted form did mountain sheep curious and slightly suspicious linger on crags to watch my slow and hesitating advance across the snow did the shadow of a soaring eagle coast and circle i must have wandered far from the direct course to timberline again and again i swung my staff to right and left hoping to strike a tree i had traveled more than twice as long as it should have taken to reach timberline before i stood face to face with a low growing tree that bristled up through the deep snow but had i come out at the point for which i aimed at the trail this was the vital question the deep snow buried all trail blazes making my way from tree to tree i thrust an arm deep into the snow and felt of the bark searching for a trail blaze at last i found a blaze and going on a few steps i dug down again in the snow and examined a tree which i felt should mark the trail this too was blazed feeling certain that i was on the trail i went down the mountain through the forest for some minutes without searching for another blaze when i did examine a number of trees not another blaze could i find the topography since entering the forest and the size and character of the trees were such that i felt i was on familiar ground but going on a few steps i came out on the edge of an unknown rocky cliff i was now lost as well as blind during the hours i had wandered in reaching timberline i had had a vague feeling that i might be traveling in a circle and might return to trees on the western slope of the divide up which i had climbed when i walked out on the edge of the cliff the feeling that i had doubled to the western slope became insistent if true this was most serious to reach the nearest house on the west side of the range would be extremely difficult even though i should discover just where i was but i believed i was somewhere on the eastern slope i tried to figure out the course i had taken had i in descending from the heights gone too far to the right or to the left though fairly well acquainted with the country along this timberline i was unable to recall a rocky cliff at this point my staff found no bottom and warned me that i was at a jumping off place increasing coolness indicated that night was upon me but darkness did not matter my light had failed at noon going back along my trail a short distance i avoided the cliff and started on through the night down a rocky forested and snow-covered slope i planned to get into the bottom of a canyon and follow downstream every few steps i shouted hoping to attract the attention of a possible prospector miner or woodchopper no voice answered the many echoes however gave me an idea of the topography of the mountain ridges and canyons before me i listened intently after each shout and noticed the direction from which the reply came its intensity and the cross echoes and concluded that i was going down into the head of a deep 
forest-walled canyon, and I hoped traveling eastward. For points of the compass I appealed to the trees, hoping through my knowledge of woodcraft to orient myself. In the study of tree distribution I had learned that the altitude might often be approximated and the points of the compass determined by noting the characteristic kinds of trees canyons of east and west trend in this locality carried mostly limber pines on the wall that faces south and mostly engelmann spruces on the wall that faces the north believing that i was traveling eastward i turned to my right climbed out of the canyon and examined a number of trees along the slope most of these were engelmann spruces the slope probably faced north turning about i descended this slope and ascended the opposite one the trees on this were mostly limber pines hurrah limber pines are abundant only on the southern slopes with limber pines on my left and engelmann spruces on my right i was now satisfied that i was traveling eastward and must be on the eastern side of the range to put a final check on this for a blind or lost man sometimes manages to do exactly the opposite of what he thinks he is doing i examine lichen growths on the rocks and moss growths on trees in the deep canyon i dug down into the snow and examined the faces of low-lying boulders with the greatest care i felt the lichen growth on the rocks these verified the information that i had from the trees but none too well then i felt over the moss growth both long and short on the trunks and lower limbs of trees but this testimony was not absolutely convincing the moss growth was so nearly even all the way around the trunk that i concluded that the surrounding topography must be such as to admit the light freely from all quarters and also that the wall or slope on my right must be either a gentle one or else a low one and somewhat broken i climbed to make sure in a few minutes i was on a terrace as i expected possibly back on the right lay a basin that might be tributary to this canyon the reports made by the echoes of my shoutings said that this was true a few minutes of travel down the canyon and i came to the expected incoming stream which made its swift presence heard beneath its cover of ice and snow a short distance further down the canyon i examined a number of trees that stood in thick growth on the lower part of what i thought was the southern slope here the character of the moss and lichens and their abundant growth on the northerly sides of the trees verified the testimony of the tree distribution and of previous moss and lichen growths i was satisfied as to the points of the compass i was on the eastern side of the continental divide traveling eastward after three or four hours of slow descending i reached the bottom steep walls rose on both right and left the enormous rock masses and the entanglements of fallen and leaning trees made progress difficult feeling that if i continued in the bottom of the canyon i might come to a precipitous place down which i would be unable to descend i tried to walk along one of the side walls and thus keep above the bottom but the walls were too steep and i got into trouble out on a narrow snow corniced ledge i walked the snow gave way beneath me and down i went over the ledge as i struck feet foremost one snowshoe sank deeply i wondered as i wiggled out if i had landed on another ledge i had not desiring to have more tumbles I tried to climb back up on the ledge from which I had fallen, but I could not do it. The ledge was broad and short, and there appeared to be no safe way off. As I explored again, my staff encountered the top of a dead tree 
that leaned against the ledge breaking a number of dead limbs off i threw them overboard listening as they struck the snow below i concluded that it could not be more than thirty feet to the bottom i let go of my staff and dropped it after the limbs then without taking off snowshoes i let myself down the limbless trunk i could hear water running beneath the ice and snow i recovered my staff and resumed the journey in time the canyon widened a little and traveling became easier i had just paused to give a shout when a rumbling and crashing high up the right hand slope told me that a snow slide was plunging down whether it would land in the canyon before me or behind me or on top of me could not be guessed the awful smashing and crashing and roar proclaimed it of enormous size and indicated that trees and rocky debris were being swept onward with it during the few seconds that i stood awaiting my fate thought after thought raced through my brain as i recorded the ever varying crashes and thunders of the wild irresistible slide with terrific crash and roar the snow slide swept into the canyon a short distance in front of me i was knocked down by the outrush or concussion of air and for several minutes was nearly smothered with the whirling settling snow dust and rock powder which fell thickly all around the air cleared and i went on i had gone only a dozen steps when i came upon the enormous wreckage brought down by the slide snow earthy matter rocks and splintered trees were flung in fierce confusion together for three or four hundred feet this accumulation filled the canyon from wall to wall and was fifty or sixty feet high the slide wreckage smashed the ice and dammed the stream as i started to climb across this snowy debris a shattered place in the ice beneath gave way and dropped me into the water but my long staff caught and by clinging to it i saved myself from going in above my hips my snowshoes caught in the shattered ice and while i tried to get my feet free a mass of snow fell upon me and nearly broke my hold shaking off the snow i put forth all my strength and finally pulled my feet free of the ice and crawled out upon the debris this was a close call and at last i was thoroughly briefly frightened as the wreckage was a mixture of broken trees stones and compacted snow i could not use my snowshoes so i took them off to carry them till over the debris once across i planned to pause and build a fire to dry my icy clothes with difficulty i worked my way up and across much of the snow was compressed almost to ice by the force of contact and in this icy cement many kinds of wreckage were set in wild disorder while descending a steep place in this mass carrying snowshoes under one arm the footing gave way and i fell i suffered no injury but lost one of the snowshoes for an hour or longer i searched without finding it the night was intensely cold and in the search my feet became almost frozen in order to rub them i was about to take off my shoes when i came upon something warm it proved to be a dead mountain sheep with one horn smashed off as i sat with my feet beneath its warm carcass and my hands upon it i thought how but a few minutes before the animal had been alive on the heights with all its ever wide awake senses vigilant for its preservation yet i wandering blindly had escaped with my life when the snow slide swept into the canyon the night was calm but of zero temperature or lower it probably was crystal clear 
as i sat warming my hands and feet upon the proud master of the crags i imagined the bright clear sky crowded thick with stars i pictured to myself the dark slope down which the slide had come it appeared to reach up close to the frosty stars but the lost snowshoe must be found wallowing through the deep mountain snow with only one snowshoe would be almost hopeless i had vainly searched the surface and lower wreckage projections but made one more search this proved successful the shoe had slid for a short distance struck an obstacle bounced upward over smashed logs and lay about four feet above the general surface a few moments more and i was beyond the snowslide wreckage again on snowshoes staff in hand i continued feeling my way down the mountain my ice stiffened trousers and chilled limbs were not good travelling companions and at the first cliff that i encountered i stopped to make a fire i gathered two or three armfuls of dead limbs with the aid of my hatchet and soon had a lively blaze going but the heat increased the pain in my eyes so with clothes only partly dried i went on repeatedly through the night i applied snow to my eyes trying to subdue the fiery torment from timberline i had traveled downward through a green forest mostly of engelmann spruce with a scattering of fir and limber pine i frequently felt of the tree trunks but a short time after leaving my campfire i came to the edge of an extensive region that had been burned over for more than an hour i traveled through dead standing trees on many of which only the bark had been burned away on others the fire had burned more deeply pausing on the way down i thrust my staff into the snow and leaned against a tree to hold snow against my burning eyes while i was doing this two owls hooted happily to each other and i listened to their contented calls with satisfaction hearing the pleasant low call of a chickadee i listened apparently he was dreaming and talking in his sleep the dream must have been a happy one for every note was cheerful realizing that he probably was in an abandoned woodpecker nesting hole i tapped on the dead tree against which i was leaning this was followed by a chorus of lively surprised chirpings and one two three and then several chickadees flew out of a hole a few inches above my head sorry to have disturbed them i went on down the slope at last i felt the morning sun on my face with increased light my eyes became extremely painful for a time i relaxed upon the snow finding it difficult to believe that i had been traveling all night in complete darkness while lying here i caught the scent of smoke there was no mistaking it it was the smoke of burning aspen a wood much burned in the cook stoves of mountain people eagerly i rose to find it i shouted again and again but there was no response under favorable conditions keen nostrils may detect aspen wood smoke for a distance of two or three miles the compensation of this accident was an intense stimulus to my imagination perhaps our most useful intellectual faculty my eyes always keen and swift had ever supplied me with almost an excess of information but with them suddenly closed my imagination became the guiding faculty i did creative thinking with pleasure i restored the views and scenes of the morning before anyone seeking to develop the imagination would find a little excursion afield with eyes voluntarily blindfolded a most telling experience down the mountainside i went hour after hour my ears caught the chirp of birds and the fall of icicles 
which ordinarily i would hardly have heard my nose was constantly and keenly analyzing the air with touch and clasp i kept in contact with the trees again my nostrils picked up aspen smoke this time it was much stronger perhaps i was near a house but the whirling air currents gave me no clue as to the direction from which the smoke came and only echoes responded to my call all my senses worked willingly in seeking wireless news to substitute for the eyes my nose readily detected odors and smoke my ears were more vigilant and more sensitive than usual my fingers too were responsive from the instant that my eyes failed delightfully eager they were as i felt the snow buried trees hoping with touch to discover possible trail blazes my feet also were quickly steadily alert to translate the topography occasionally a cloud shadow passed over in imagination i often pictured the appearance of these clouds against the blue sky and tried to estimate the size of each by the number of seconds its shadow took to drift across me mid-afternoon or later my nose suddenly detected the odor of an ancient corral this was a sign of civilization a few minutes later my staff came in contact with the corner of a cabin i shouted hello but heard no answer i continued feeling until i came to the door and found that a board was nailed across it the cabin was locked and deserted i broke in the door in the cabin i found a stove and wood as soon as i had a fire going i dropped snow upon the stove and steamed my painful eyes after two hours or more of this steaming they became more comfortable two strenuous days and one toilsome night had made me extremely drowsy sitting down upon the floor near the stove i leaned against the wall and fell asleep but the fire burned itself out in the night i awoke nearly frozen and unable to rise fortunately i had on my mittens otherwise my fingers probably would have frozen by rubbing my hands together then rubbing my arms and legs i finally managed to limber myself and though unable to rise i succeeded in starting a new fire it was more than an hour before i ceased shivering then as the room began to warm my legs came back to life and again i could walk i was hungry this was my first thought of food since becoming blind if there was anything to eat in the cabin i failed to find it searching my pockets i found a dozen or more raisins and with these i broke my sixty-hour fast then i had another sleep and it must have been near noon when i awakened again i steamed the eye pain into partial submission going to the door i stood and listened a camp bird only a few feet away spoke gently and confidingly then a crested jay called impatiently the camp bird alighted on my shoulder i tried to explain to the birds that there was nothing to eat the prospector who had lived in this cabin evidently had been friendly with the bird neighbors i wished that i might know him again i could smell the smoke of aspen wood several shouts evoked echoes nothing more i stood listening and wondering whether to stay in the cabin or to venture forth and try to follow the snow-filled roadway that must lead down through the woods from the cabin wherever this open way led i could follow but of course i must take care not to lose it in the nature of things i felt that i must be three or four miles to the south of the trail which i had planned to follow down the mountain i wished i might see my long and crooked line of footmarks in the snow from the summit to timberline hearing the open water in rapids close to the cabin i went out to try for a drink i advanced slowly blind man fashion feeling the way with my long staff 
as i neared the rapids a water oozel which probably had lunched in the open water sang with all his might i stood still as he repeated his liquid hopeful song on the spot i shook off procrastination and decided to try to find a place where someone lived after writing a note explaining why i had smashed in the door and used so much wood i readjusted my snowshoes and started down through the woods i suppose it must have been late afternoon i found an open way that had been made into a road the woods were thick and the open roadway readily guided me feeling and thrusting with my staff i walked for some time at normal pace then i missed the way i searched carefully right left and before me for the utterly lost road it had forked and i had continued on the short stretch that came to an end in the woods by an abandoned prospect hole as i approached close to this the snow caved in nearly carrying me along with it confused by blinded eyes and the thought of oncoming night perhaps i had not used my wits when at last i stopped to think i figured out the situation then i followed my snowshoe tracks back to the main road and turned into it for a short distance the road ran through dense woods several times i paused to touch the trees each side with my hands when i emerged from the woods the pungent aspen smoke said that i must at last be near a human habitation in fear of passing it i stopped to use my ears as i stood listening a little girl gently curiously asked are you going to stay here tonight end of chapter one chapter two of the adventures of a nature guide by enos mills this librivox recording is in the public domain waiting in the wilderness that is lingering in a spot frequently visited by wild life appears to be one of the easiest and most delightful ways of getting acquainted with nature and the ways of the wild going repeatedly to the same place means the visiting of an old scene in which changes are constantly taking place during your absence and in which the beginning of something new may occur while you are there so to have a really intimate and happy acquaintance and a most thorough appreciation of the wild world stage one must revisit the same stage again and again chapter two waiting in the wilderness they were a pair of hairy woodpeckers engaged in examining a fourteen inch dead aspen as it was nesting time i lingered to watch them after taking a number of grubs from beneath the bark of the tree the birds centered their woodpecking work at one spot about a man's height above the roots mrs woodpecker pecked a number of tiny holes or dots forming a circle about two inches in diameter then she pecked and hammered away within this circle presently this space began to take on the form of a doorway or entrance hole to a nest chips and broken bits flew the birds worked rapidly one at a time while mrs woodpecker worked her mate watched nearby and tried two or three times to take a hand but she thrust him aside and kept on pecking and hammering until at last she grew tired and his turn came after three hours a sizable impression was made in the tree and both birds flew away into the aspen grove i waited half an hour but they did not come back after spending more than an hour looking over a beaver house on the bank of a brook distant a stone's throw i returned to the aspen but 
the woodpeckers were still away the aspen grove in which these birds were working stood within the seclusion of a mountain forest nearby ran a brook from west to east to the south of the brook behind the aspen grove a spruce forest covered the slope on the north a pine woods stretched away between the pine wood and the brook was a grassy opening with a pile of boulders through the grove and across the brook ran a wildlife trail busy was the life in the woods i had frequent glimpses of wildlife folk an occasional view of a one-act play in which any number of performers took lively part close to me at one time a weasel aggressive as a lion killed a number of mice and at another time i saw a weasel kill a chipmunk among the birds and small animals there were comedies courtships feasts fights and frolics all took place in a bit of the wild across which a primitive man could have hurled his spear the unexpected often happened the hours never dragged they were enlivened by a succession of incidents and episodes again and again i enjoyed this primeval poetic place for hours while i sat unmoved and watchful in the scene often i lay on a log or on the ground or hid in the bushes or sometimes simply stood like a stump wherever i might be without moving i let ants crawl over me and insects bite me as they would frequently there was a shower of rain which when not accompanied by wind or lightning had a softening subduing effect upon all the forest sounds two days after i had first observed the woodpecker homemakers i found them working industriously in the hole which was now more than three inches deep only a part of the chips flew out of the hole as they were cut the rest were swept out from time to time by mr woodpecker this feat he performed by leaning back and turning his head quickly his bill acting as the broom woodpeckers often select the aspen for a nesting site probably because of its soft easily worked wood frequently they take dead partly decayed trees in which nests are most easily made and dead trees too often are filled with grubs ants and other woodpecker food by the fifth day the woodpeckers had cut the hole to a depth of about seven inches the workers continued at their task and finished the nest to average size after excavating seven inches into the tree the entrance way curved downward into the trunk to a depth of about twelve inches the lower section having a diameter of six inches all this was the work of eleven days the woodpecker's nest is one of the cleanest and safest and probably the most continuously comfortable of all birds nests it keeps out the rain and excludes the extremes of cold and heat it is perhaps less likely to be discovered by enemies than the nest of any other bird rarely does an accident befall it what a strange cunning place for young birds to grow up in how interested they must be the first time they climb up and from the doorway peep into the strange wilderness world nearly a month elapsed before i was again in the aspen grove when i tapped lightly on the woodpecker's tree four agitated bills were thrust out of the doorway but as they saw nothing to eat the four red-topped youngsters withdrew their bills and i suppose settled back to the bottom of the nest presently one of the old birds appeared and instantly bills receivable were again presented through the doorway after feeding one of the youngsters the old bird eyed me for a moment with a peculiar look suggesting curiosity however rather than fear it flew away and a moment later its mate arrived with a grub in its bill 
i missed the pleasure of seeing the young woodpeckers leave the nest and make their baby start in the wooded world but one october day i was back in the grove and paused to watch as usual the continuous though ever-changing performances while i was standing near the nest tree a busy chipmunk climbed up and peeped into the deserted woodpecker nest then he climbed up a few feet higher went round the tree and came back to the nest after several times thrusting in his head and forefeet each time withdrawing quickly and retreating almost to the grass he finally found courage and bravely entered out rushed a frightened field mouse a few moments later the chipmunk thrust out his head and with feet on the edge of the entrance hole he looked round like a young lion the nest became his winter quarters one day a month later i saw him again thrust his head from this adopted nest tracks in the snow at the foot of the tree showed that he came out occasionally the following may when i called a pair of bluebirds were striking and beating at the chipmunk who was clinging to the tree trunk near the nest entrance the chipmunk finally leaped off and retreated into the grove with the birds in pursuit again and again i came to linger at my old place during the summer five baby bluebirds were raised in this nest after they were safely brought off and taken in charge by mr bluebird the mother bird again filled the nest with eggs i did not make my rounds again until summer was over when i returned the chipmunk who occupied it the previous year or a chipmunk of the same species and about the same size was in the nest more likely it was the same chipmunk for when i threw a peanut to him he made haste to pick it up a trick he had learned during my visits the year previous the next spring in the grove i heard a wren singing with all his might what busy happy aggressive and confiding little folk wrens are i was glad when i found that mr and mrs wren would keep house for the summer in the woodpecker nest a robin was a near neighbor nesting on the top of a high broken pine stump often while i lay or stood watching the wrens a camp bird the rocky mountain gray jay came to see me plainly with the hope that i would have a bite of something to offer of all the birds that i have seen none on first sight is so trustful of man as is the camp bird that winter and the following summer i often saw a tiny owl come out of the woodpecker's old nest where a pair of owls must have been nesting i think anyway for more than a year it was their wooden walled home that year a pair of woodpeckers had a nest in the upper end of the aspen grove as they allowed me to approach more closely than other hairy woodpeckers i believe they were my former acquaintances whom i had watched two years before in the upper end of the grove another pair of hairy woodpeckers had a nest nearly twenty feet above the ground which they had evidently used for three summers in succession a short distance down the brook i one day came upon an abandoned woodpecker nest probably that of a sap sucker it was not more than three feet above the ground two summers later it was occupied by a pair of hairy woodpeckers one day hearing a rather alarmed peek peek and thinking that something was happening to one of the woodpeckers i made haste to the brook where i saw two kingfishers looking upstream the alarm cry of these birds is very like that of the hairy woodpecker there on a log sat a mink evidently the cause of the excitement the view i had of these kingfishers heads as they stood up reminded me of the heads of two football players Returning from this inspection, I was astonished to see a flicker alight on the nest tree and take a peek into the doorway of the woodpecker nest. The arrival of one of the bird owners made him take a hurried leave. 
there are three hundred and fifty known species of woodpeckers in the world they are found nearly everywhere that there are trees and in a few treeless places i believe that there are no woodpeckers in australia of the twenty-five species found in north america one of the smaller and more common is the hairy woodpecker he is a valuable bird and saves many a tree from insect death the rocky mountain hairy woodpecker has a length of about nine inches although he is whitish beneath with grayish legs the general effect when he is at rest is blackish the outer tail feathers are white tipped and the wings show spots of white just above and below the eye is a narrow white stripe and a narrow white and red stripe crosses the back of the head the youngsters commonly have a reddish top the food of the hairy woodpecker consists of wood borers spiders moths ants and occasionally berries though they summer and nest in high altitudes often nearly eleven thousand feet above sea level they commonly descend the mountains with the approach of winter and spend the cooler months among the foothills the rocky mountain hairy woodpecker is not so fond of living in orchards and being near people as is his cousin the downy although human visitors to his home region do not annoy him he plainly enjoys the seclusion of pathless forests these woodpeckers probably mate for life and are quietly devoted enjoying each other's company without demonstration for a week or two in late spring mr hairy woodpecker is noisy enough he simply fills the woods with drumming drumming he calls and calls merrily with many a change of tone often it is a kick 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 put 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 wee 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 but as soon as the white eggs are laid there are from three to six in number he does his full share of incubating them i was standing in an open space one day watching the movements of a squirrel when i chanced to see coming toward me mrs skunk and three pretty little skunkies as these skunks came closer it looked as though i might move shortly they were walking leisurely apparently going to a definite place and all carried their tails elevated at a decorative social angle naturally i did not wish to dispute their right to the trail i held my ground from sheer will-power but they concluded to take a little passageway about six feet in front of me i stood like a statue to watch them go by in passing mrs skunk tilted her head and looked at me out of one eye but without changing her pace or saying anything to the children kept on her way nothing happened but never before did i borrow so much trouble in a few seconds about thirty feet beyond me mother skunk paused and dug out a mouse squirrels were about a fremont squirrel lived in the pines to the south of my watching place another a short distance to the north this little gray fellow is closely related to the douglas squirrel of california he is one of the smallest of the squirrel family he is fiery curious and wide awake he has as much courage and individuality to his inches as any animal i have ever seen i often heard one of these squirrels as he clucked chattered or talked to himself occasionally he denounced with terrific violence a passing animal or intruder the first few days that i watched proceedings in the grove the squirrel nearest to my station showed immense curiosity he was unable to make out what i was about one day he rushed at me and with a savage outburst threatened either to devour me or to kick me off his premises as i remained silent and motionless he paused in astonishment then he backed up and eyed me eagerly again he tried bluff and denunciation at last 
doubtless wondering why i was not moving and whether i should remain long he gave it up climbed into his tree and proceeded with his own affairs one day when a swarm of bees started to light upon me i made a lively retreat this disturbed mr squirrel he broke out in volleys of peppery chatter that lasted for two or three minutes then he subsided and sat looking at me i imagined that he might be thinking or saying to himself well for the life of me this is something i cannot understand from dawn until dusk i once watched the activities of this fellow though he was sometimes temporarily out of sight i waited wondering what the next move would be he climbed into the treetops and cut off cones which fell bounced and rolled away and appeared to try to land where he could not find them often he stopped to look and listen and make sure that no outsider was capturing his cones my squirrel friend had a sad end lightning one day struck a tree frequented by him on the south side of the stream and killed him the bolt literally knocked the head off this tree and it threw half a dozen young birds out of a nest in a tree nearby evidently this other tree had been struck twice before a few years previously a bolt had run down one side bursting the bark through this break a number of beetles had made their way to begin work on the vitals of the tree but chief surgeon woodpecker was often there and in a length of sixteen feet along this broken trunk had made sixteen holes and had probably removed many a borer once i saw a large dignified mountain sheep walk quietly across the grassy opening he did not see me on reaching the further edge he turned about recrossed the opening to the boulder pile and leaped upon it after remaining there statuesque a while he re-entered the woods stood for a moment and then disappeared it was impossible to feel lonesome eyes and ears were kept busy for the show went ever on it was a one ring a three ring sometimes a six ring show all at once too often a number of extra good things were going on together a squirrel would be up to something while at the same instant two chipmunks would be having a boundary line dispute along with these a robin might be noisy and pessimistic over something that may not have happened while a rare warbler that i wanted to see was darting about in the treetops and a porcupine was waddling by with dull deliberation the birds on the other side of the brook one afternoon set up a great ado as if some enemy were about to raid them or some other terror were nigh of them all the most excited and pessimistic was the mother robin she flew and darted about without getting anywhere all the time predicting the worst possible calamity when things had almost calmed down a broad-tailed hummingbird came flying by scolding hard plainly much put out because of all this unnecessary hullabaloo after darting about me for some seconds with her burnished body flashing and bead-like eyes shining she alighted like any bird on a neighboring limb this midget made a comical appearance aping as it seemed all the poses of a real sized bird once i looked round just in time to see a coyote leap forward and land upon the grass with four paws together presently he thrust in his nose and pulled out a mouse at this instant he caught sight of me and edged off sideways eyeing me intently he was not frightened but apparently could not make out what i was or what i was doing he passed doubled and repassed nearby then he circled and when he caught my scent sniffed the air but still was not alarmed he stayed to watch like a boy in no hurry 
who had found something new in the edge of the opening he stretched out on his stomach with his head toward me occasionally his nostrils twitched a little but at no time did he look upon me with fear or suspicion soon sounded a whack from the nearby beaver pond as if a beaver had dived and a second later came muffled footfalls through the forest from the opposite quarter these alarms caused mr coyote to leap up all alert and presently he hastened away among the shadows a number of deer came to visit the place after eyeing me closely from a distance of thirty or forty feet they lingered to look round and to take an occasional bite to eat they were curious about me but were perfectly at ease for they had not scented me another day three deer which had not seen me suddenly caught scent of me and were off instantly most animals rely upon their noses for chief scout duty to tell them when to flee for safety deer beavers and sometimes other animals which saw me without scenting me simply took a brief look then continued their affairs in a normal manner but usually when they scented me before seeing me they were alarmed and thought that safety first required speed a mother grouse and her family of youngsters came along while i was sitting on a log i kept perfectly still one of the youngsters jumped up on the log and started toward me two or three walked close to me and some of the others passed between my legs and the log evidently they took me for a bump or a stump the mother bird was behind walking vigilantly and with stately dignity the youngster on the log came up to me and pecked at a button on my coat i turned to look this told the mother that i was alive it suggested danger she instantly flung herself at me and struck me a slap on the side of the head dropping back she again lunged and beat me with her wings her brave behavior was very like that of a hen in the defense of her chicks once just before sundown a solitaire lighted on a tall spruce top and poured forth his elemental and eloquent song it was divinely beautiful in the evening hush of the wilderness he sang with all his melody and all his might often in his enthusiasm he hurled himself upward or outward from the treetop then settled or returned on easy outstretched wings singing all the time no song that i have ever heard so harmonizes with the silences and the feeling of a mountain wilderness or so completely puts one in tune with the universe as the marvelous melody of the solitaire momentarily one day i took my eyes from the woodpeckers a rabbit came hopping along completely unmindful of my presence passed me and presently disappeared among the trees a minute later a soft-footed coyote came following on the rabbit's trail though so near he evidently did not see me but hurried along and disappeared behind an old pine i do not know what happened on another occasion a flutter of wings and a chirp caused me to turn near me a little chickadee was working away at a hole in a dead snag and was just in the act of spitting out a mouthful of dead wood here was another nest builder once a black bear came along and stopped under the pines on a knoll not far from me here he rolled over an old ant-filled log out rushed ferociously about a million ants which the bear licked up rapidly with a pleased expression presently he came a little closer to me and dug out a mouse then he flushed a number of grasshoppers but in leaping into the air and striking at one of these on the wing he scented me and at once beat a retreat one day i left my old watching place and climbed the heights as usual i moved quietly and slowly and once on the skyline i paused to look around 
lying near a spring in the center of the terrace was a deer as i watched her nibbling at the plants around her from the position of one of her legs i judged that it was broken probably by a bullet suddenly the wind warned her that a deadly enemy was near instantly she leaped up forgetful of her broken bones she stood and smelled but without discovering me watching my chance i slipped away i had not gone far before darkness advised stopping and i spent the night by a fire without bedding next morning advancing in the breeze i climbed up to watch the doe she lay still nearly all day most of the time her ears moved nervously about as she caught sounds from this way and that when an eagle soared overhead she showed much uneasiness but moved only eyes and ears in mid-afternoon she was startled by the fall of a rock mass down one of the crags nearby a short time after this some mountain sheep appeared on the skyline above posed and looked quietly around from the actions of the sheep the doe evidently concluded that all was well she struggled slowly to her feet giving a low call as she rose soon i knew that a fawn was having a warm meal i do not know where the fawn had been hidden realizing that the deer should not be disturbed for some days i moved on to enjoy other scenes and left her in possession among the actors who appeared where i next watched were a bear and her two boyish cubs a peppery curious fremont squirrel in a tree nearby saw them approach he ceased work eyed them for a time with lively curiosity then with apparent contempt at last he went on with his work without voicing a protest until later when the cubs engaged in a playful scuffle mother bear lumbered along under the trees unaware or indifferent that the squirrel apparently in his own estimation one of the most ferocious animals in the wilds might leap down upon her at one place she stopped thrust a forepaw beneath the upturned roots of a fallen tree and with a lift and a push thrust the heavy bulky mass aside she licked the earth a few times probably to pick up some bugs or ants and then started on the cubs dropped behind and began digging they were having a beautiful time the mother paused looked and went back to see what it was all about they were working with great zest and she apparently supposed that they had scented something worth while in the rudest manner she pushed each aside smelled in the hole found nothing and at once started on the cubs followed they came so close to me that i thought surely they would either see or scent me but they passed me by unnoticed and a short distance away found choke cherry bushes on the side of a ravine the mother bear at once began feasting on the puckery ripe berries evidently she cared nothing for conservation for she crushed down and bit off the bushes she rose on her hind feet and with mouth and claws together grasped at the laden ends of the branches limb ends leaves berries all were devoured but choke cherries evidently were a dessert for which her youngsters did not care the berries may have been new to them at any rate two bites satisfied them the bulging rounded little stomachs plainly indicated many helpings of other eatables even a bear cub can be filled up for a time they lay relaxed in the sun then they rose stood up and showed off they struck out like green awkward boxers they struck at nothing or sometimes with both paws held low and at an angle and sometimes with one paw held high then they had a wrestling match clinching hugging and rolling their first belligerent attitude brought rather a vehement protest from the squirrel 
who quickly subsided however and became a silent spectator a camp bird also looked on watching them from the limb of a pine he observed closely but did not appear enthusiastic over the exhibition what a number of incidents in this little area quite as many may also happen in countless other small spaces often i wondered about things that took place when i was away what quiet interesting unseen incidents that i never even suspected were ever occurring the aspen grove round the woodpecker's nest was made up of trees from six to fifteen inches in diameter and thirty to sixty feet high most of their bark was milk white under the trees were a few bushes and many grassy spaces in which violets columbines harebells gentians and other flowers bloomed in summer butterflies with painted wings floated and circled over the sunny opening rarely did they fold their wings and alight occasionally one sailed through the woods following a fairy avenue its bright beautiful color gave a charm and an illumination to the forest gloom bees visited the flowers and occasionally a bumblebee buzzed hurriedly through as if in desperate haste to reach a certain place and knowing well his destination grasshoppers too in the autumn days enlivened the scene occasionally a huge fellow leaped out of the grass with a crackling and the flash of color like a fairy rocket before he settled back often i was in the grove when the snowflakes fell and i saw the colored leaves fall one by one grandly the moon shone in these scenes early morning and evening lights under the trees and through the woods were strange and beautiful they put the trees at their best and in attitudes different from those shown in the downpouring light of midday the aspen grove where i frequently watched the manners and customs of our wild kindred was a much better place in which to study natural history than that afforded by any zoo i wish that a company of boys and girls might have been with me how they would have enjoyed these real nature stories i am sure they would have been happy but thanks to the audubon society to other organizations and to numerous individuals boys and girls are beginning to watch enjoy and receive the benefits of knowing the wild people of the woods who dress in fur and feathers yes mother nature conducts a delightful outdoor school and it is open every day of the year wherever there is a bit of wildness there are pretty certain to be numerous interesting little wild people of course bird reservations are even better places for this kind of schooling and fun but the greatest of all places for these advantages are our national parks surely one of the best pastimes for children for anyone is to wait at a wildlife center and watch the ways of its residents and its visitors to do this is pleasant self-discipline it is constructive it keeps the eyes open and the senses alert it gives material for thought and compels thinking it arouses the imagination and wakes up the creative faculties the faculty of keen observation the ability to see accurately and the incentive to watch for things that may happen around us add much to every outdoor day such happy experiences as these truly enrich life end of chapter two Chapter Three of the Adventures of a Nature Guide by Enos Mills. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It has been said of Louis Agassiz in his later American travels he would talk of glacial phenomena to the driver of a country stagecoach among the mountains, or to some workman 
splitting rock at the roadside with as much earnestness as if he had been discussing problems with a brother geologist he would take the common fisherman into his scientific confidence telling him the intimate secrets of fish structure or fish embryology till the man in his turn became enthusiastic and began to pour out information from the stores of his own rough and untaught habits of observation agassiz's general faith in the susceptibility of the popular intelligence however untrained to the highest truths of nature was contagious and he created or developed that in which he believed chapter three winter mountaineering after a heavy snowfall one december morning i started on skis for two weeks camping in the colorado rockies the fluffy snow lay smooth and unbroken over the broken mountains here and there black pine and spruce trees uplifted arrowheads and snow cones of the white mantle on the steep slope half a mile from my cabin i was knocked to one side by a barrel mass of snow dropping upon me from a tree and one ski escaped as if glad to be off on an adventure of its own it sped down the mountainside like a shot it bumped into a low stump skied high into the air and over a treetop and then fell undamaged in the deep snow recovering my runaway ski i started for the summit of the range a distance of about nine miles from my cabin for an hour i followed a stream whose swift waters now and then splashed up through the broken icy skylights then leaving the canyon and skirting the slope i was on the plateau summit of the continental divide twelve thousand feet above the sea the summit moor was deeply overlaid with undrifted snow southward it extended mile after mile rising higher and higher into the sky in broken snow-covered peaks to the north the few small broken cliffs and low buttes emphasized the trackless solitude this plateau or moorland was less than one mile wide and comparatively smooth its edges descended precipitously two thousand feet into cirques and canyons southward i traveled along the nearly level expanse of undrifted snow looking back along the line of my ski tracks i saw a mountain lion leisurely cross from east to west apparently she had come up out of the woods for mad play and slaughter among the unfortunate snowbound folk of the summit she stopped at my tracks for an interested look turned her head and glanced back along the way i had come then her eyes appeared to follow my tracks to the boulder pile from behind which i was then looking playfully bouncing off the snow she struck into my ski prints with one forepaw lightly as a kitten then she dived into them pretended to pick up something between her forepaws reared and with a swing tossed it into the air then her playful mood changed and she started on across the divide after several steps she stopped looking back as if she had forgotten something but was a little too lazy to retrace her steps but finally she came back she walked along my ski tracks for a few steps then began to romp now and then making a great leap forward and rolled and struck about with the pretense of worrying something she had captured she repeated this pantomime a few times and then as if suddenly remembering her original plan of action again walked westward arriving at the summit she hesitated and when i saw her last she was calmly surveying the scenes far below on the mountain skyline i crossed a white tundra half expecting to see an eskimo peer from a snow mound arctic plants buried in the snow and ptarmigan eskimo chickens in their snow-white dress were the only signs of life 
later in the day i saw a white weasel slipping over the snow toward a number of the ptarmigan often on the summits the ptarmigan in leggings and coats of pure white watched me and allowed me to come and remain near they like the snowshoe rabbit skimmed over the surface on home-grown snowshoes possibly from them the eskimos got the idea of the webbed snowshoe which they have used for ages more than once when weathering gales where the thick insistent snow dust made me acquainted with the unpleasant sensations of strangulation i have envied the rosy finch and other birds of the snow who have a well-developed screen to keep choking snow dust out of the nostrils the eskimos also have a slotted wooden shield to protect the eye from the burning glare of reflected sunlight i descended a few hundred feet into the upper edge of the woods to find shelter for the night clearing out the snow between a cliff and a rock about six feet from it i had an excellent lodging place i built a roaring fire and heated a number of stones when this space was warmed i pushed the fire and the heated stones along the open space between the rock and the cliff then i started a fire against the base of the detached rock two huge sticks were placed at the bottom of this fire pile over these smaller ones were laid and at the top still smaller ones i set fire to this on the top so that it would burn slowly and not be at its hottest for an hour or two within the circle of warmth i placed my elk skin sleeping bag crawled into it and slept for nearly four hours when the cold awakened me i renewed both fires then had another short sleep when i again awoke i was ready for another day's adventure i set off through a forested slope that tilted gently toward the sun black shadows long and straight lay upon the forest floor the crowded pines were slender and limbless except at the top across an opening these slender shadows were at their best with the snow glistening in white lines between their deep black ones after two hours i came out upon a white and treeless meadow across which shadows were flying moving cloud shadows rushed across and the shadow of a soaring eagle appeared swiftly skating in circles over the snow i spent hours reading the news observing the illustrations and studying the hieroglyphics on the snow whether footprints in the mud or snow may have suggested printing cannot be told but it is certain that the tracks stains and impressions in snow print the news and record the local animal doings here the rabbits played there the grouse searched for dinner while over yonder the long lacy trail of a mouse ends significantly between the impressions of two wing feathers one sees a trail made by a long-legged animal and another by a fellow with a long body and short legs perhaps a weasel at one place near the foot of an old tree a squirrel had abandoned a cone and run home nearby was the trail of a porcupine who was well fed well protected and though dull-witted not at all afraid apparently he hadn't any idea where he was going and did not care whom he should meet for at one place he came face to face with a fox and the fox turned aside footprints often reveal the excitement hesitation change of plan and the preparation of two wild folks advancing and about to meet most animals except the grizzly though concerned with sight and scent appear not to consider the impressions in the tell-tale snow i passed again through woods where the previous winter i had walked upon ten feet of snow in that trip i had looked down upon a camp bird cuddled in an old nest 
i talked to her for a minute and as is common with her kind she came close seeking something to eat three eggs were in the nest though it was february never before had i found a bird nesting in the famine month of the year these eggs may not have hatched but another time i saw a nest of this species in march with eggs that did hatch april is the nesting time for this bird why a pair sometimes nest unusually early is their secret i found the crested jay that flings forth its jarring note as harsh and cold as frosty steel using these mountains for winter quarters a few of this species remain for the summer but the majority nest further north the water ouzel is a winter songster and twice during this outing in a snow-filled canyon he sang to me cheerily he may be seen and heard in any month of the year this bird of quiet cheering presence is an outdoor enthusiast he was always delightfully busy and indifferent to my close approach if i came quietly and slowly the scarlet berries and small shining green leaves of the kinnikinick gave color and charm to many snowy places half buried in the snow in the sun or shadow in niches of crags or as wreath-like coverings for the rocks they were bright and cheerful everywhere i can imagine that the winter birds and animals worship the chinook wind one evening i went to sleep shivering i was awakened through being too warm and leaped out of my sleeping bag thinking it must be on fire then i discovered that in the night a chinook had come this warm dry wind occasionally follows a blizzard and often it appears to make a sudden and triumphant attack upon a cold period during the short day or two that it dominates it is a blessing it often raises the temperature thirty or more degrees in a few hours on another cold windy night i had a poor camp and damp clothes i had examined the ice around a beaver house to see if it was built by a spring it was and i had broken through the thin ice that night as i shivered by a slow fire i wished that i might have occupied a woodpecker's house i took comfort in the fact that at no time during the trip would i be annoyed by flies and mosquitoes from the sheltering edge of the woods i watched the high wind stir and sweep the excited snow the snowflakes had long since been reduced to powder and dust by colliding with cliffs and by being thrown violently against the earth the wind was intermittent a wave of snow dust swept along the snow-crusted earth filling the air then a few seconds of sunshine played before the next wave followed occasionally everything cleared and stopped for an exhibit of the whirlwind a towering white column of snow dust would spin across the scene this commonly was followed by another and heavier spiral that was more like a confusion of white whirled clouds all this time the sun was shining in a blue sky and all this time too a sparkling pennant of diamond snow dust and powder a mile long was fluttering from the tip of a triangular peak with such scenes in mind the trees abloom with flakes the white and sparkling whirlwinds the vast and scintillating snow powder pennants i could understand the poetic fancy of primitive people who happily named winter's gifts snow flowers and who honored the snow period with an outdoor celebration after all winter is but a transient return of the ice age with fresh falls on the heights above timberline before the wind blows the vast world appears overlaid with a permanent stratum of snow across white distances one looks for miles without seeing a tree or any living object or even a shadow 
unless it be that of a passing cloud though the high mountains have their snowstorms and their eternal snowfields in most mountain ranges the snowfall on the middle slopes of the mountains is heavier than upon the high plateaus and summits on the heights the wind has free play and sweeps most of the snow into enormous piles or drifts these are one hundred or more feet deep and sometimes cover nearly a square mile owing to their depth the low temperature of the heights and the fact that they are so densely packed these snow masses endure throughout the year wind is thus chiefly the factor in the making of snow topography small hills and plains canyons plateaus and mountain ranges all of snow are a constant source of interest one morning i awoke with dense white storm clouds all around me and the snow coming down wishing to camp that night at timberline i traveled up the mountainside in the thickly falling snow and dense clouds these clouds were drifting easily along the mountainside and together with the feathery flakes which they were shedding made it impossible to see distinctly even to the end of an extended arm suddenly i became aware of a diminished depth of snow underfoot i stooped to measure it it was less than three inches on rising i thrust my head through the silver lining the upper surface of the cloud into the sunshine the altitude was about eleven thousand feet above and about me the peaks and plateaus stood in gray and brown not a flake of all this snow had fallen upon them there was nothing to indicate that a storm had prevailed just below during the last two days and nights or that only a step down the mountain snow was still falling soundless and motionless the cloud sea lay below here and there an upthrusting pinnacle cast a shadow upon it unable to make myself believe that below me the flakes were falling thick and fast and that the ground was deeply covered with soft white snow i plunged down into the cloud after enjoying the novelty for a few minutes i climbed out of the snowstorm again and then once more descended into it as the mountainside was comparatively unbroken i walked along the upper edge of the cloud for some distance two or three times this fluffy mass swelled and rose slightly above me and then settled easily back in the head of a gulch cloud swells rose slightly higher than out in the main sea i climbed down into them a short distance thinking to cross the hidden canyon but finding it too steep walled climbed out again as i emerged from the gulch i saw nearby a huge grizzly bear sunning himself on a cliff that rose a few feet out of the cloud into the sunshine he like myself appeared greatly interested in the slow rise and fall and ragged outline of the storm cloud he was all attention to every new movement near him on scenting me he stared for a moment as if thinking where on earth did he come from then he stepped overboard into the clouds i camped that night beside a clump of storm-battered trees that marked the upper limit of the forest in the morning all was clear the cloud sea of the day before had rolled silently away along the mountainside the ragged edge of snow stretched for miles above it barren rocky peaks rose in a great mountain desert below all was soft and white a wonderful world of mountains made of snowflakes near my camp was an ancient looking tree clump none of the trees was taller than my head and though of almost normal form they were somewhat gnarled and appeared as old as the hills centuries they surely had seen trees on the forest outpost in high mountains endure severe trials 
they are dwarfed battered and broken huddled behind boulders buried or half buried in snow the forest frontier is maintained by these brave tree people seen again and again this region displays features of new interest as often as the visitor returns to it on the heights i frequently saw conies one day i lingered to watch one that was less shy than the majority he sat with his back against the sunny side of a boulder looking serious and keeping a careful survey of his field of vision presently i discovered his haystack his supply of winter food a tiny heap of grass sedge and alpine plants it was about two feet high and was sheltered beneath two half arching stones many were the ways in which i found animals spending the winter in the course of this outing i saw several flocks of mountain sheep all these were in the heights above the tree line on the day following the snow drifting one i crossed the heights and on the summit passed close to a flock they were feeding in a space that the wind had swept bare of snow happy highlanders they were well fed and contented in their home twelve thousand feet above the tides one sunny though cold morning i came upon a large dead tree in it were a number of woodpecker holes wondering if these houses had winter dwellers i struck the tree with my hatchet instantly a dozen or more chickadees came pouring out of one of the holes like so many merry children from a hole in the opposite side of the tree flew one or more birds that i did not see out of one of the upper holes a downy woodpecker thrust his head glaring down at me with one eye impatient as late sleepers usually are when called he appeared to be wanting to say why am i disturbed this is a cold morning there are no early worms to be had in winter from another hole flew another downy i felt sure that none of these late sleepers had breakfasted seldom is an old woodpecker house without a tenant bluebirds wrens and numbers of weak billed folk nest in them during the summer while birds of other species find them life-savers in the winter a hummingbird's nest that i found brought to mind the fact that its builder if alive was then among the tropical flowers of central america later in the day i saw a flock of chickadees one or two brown creepers and a solitary woodpecker food hunting together the chickadees kept up a cheering conversation and twice i thought i heard the woodpecker give a call i wondered if these fellow food hunters also all lodged in one many-roomed apartment house coming one day to a beaver pond i scraped off the snow and looked through the clear ice into the water two or three beavers were swimming the water between the ice and the bottom of the pond was about two feet deep each autumn the beavers pile ample winter supplies in deep water close to the house the pond may freeze over but this ice covering is a protection the house entrance is on the bottom of the pond beneath the ice and the floor is above the level of the pond the water in the lower part of the house does not freeze the beaver residents were here having a comfortable time while deer in nearby woods were floundering in the snow i have known deer to have a hard time of it in winter commonly deer winter in lower altitudes but sometimes they stay in the middle mountain region and worry through the snowy weeks by yarding that is a number remaining in one small area where through daily trampling they keep on top of the snow and still find enough to eat a number of animals hibernate fat woodchucks live in a den five or six feet below the surface storms may come and go but the woodchuck sleeps till the first flowers wake the grizzly and the black bear spend from three to five months in heavy hibernating sleep plants too though anchored 
have a variety of winter customs trees may be said to hibernate even the firs and spruces that go to sleep in full dress beneath the snow are countless seeds that will live their life next year and numbers of plants that have hauled down their towers and colors for the winter you may seek them and walk over them and mother nature will only say trouble me not for the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed moss in midwinter is as fresh and charming as though knee-deep in june it is dainty and striking in a white setting mosses and lichens are ever a part of the poetry associated with ferns and the golden sands of bubbling springs they are sharers in the cheerful ever silent beauty of the wild they never intrude but are among the most subdued and harmonious decorations in all nature yet lichens carry all the colors of the rainbow in dark woods deep canyons and on the pinnacles of high peaks they cling in leafy map-like decorations of oxidized silver hammered brass pure copper and stains of yellow brown scarlet gray and green they are almost classical decorations and touch with soft color and beauty the roughest bark and boulders until one knows that they are living things they seem only chemical colorings of the crags and a part of the color scheme in the bark of trees one day during this outing i had been walking in the shadow of a mountain which together with the darkness of the spruce woods made the snow almost a gray expanse as i climbed out of the shadow onto a plateau just at sunset how splendidly dazzlingly white was the skyline of peaks on this white and broken line the sunset colored clouds strangely rested a sunset is never an old story and a colored sunset above the white west line of winter's silent earth renews the imagination of youth though i crossed a number of alpine lakes they were not to be seen they were gone from the landscape a stratum of marble instead of snow could not better have concealed them lakes flowers and bears were asleep for the winter in snowless places the brooks had decorated their ways with beautiful ice structures arches and arcades spires and frozen splashes and endless stretches and forms of silver streamside platings and boulder drapings ice crystal clear frosted and opaque many rocks were overspread with ice sheets and icy drapery and cliffs were decked with fretwork and stupendous icicles smaller streams froze to the bottom overflowed and outbuilt in places wide areas were covered to enormous depths looking upon these one might almost fancy the ice age returning but three months later the ice was gone to the far-off sea and the flowers that slept beneath were massing their brilliant blossoms in the sun an old ute chief once told me that during the hardest winter he had ever known in his country the snow for weeks lay six ponies deep the average annual snowfall in the rocky mountains is less than twenty-five feet this is less than the average for the alps meetings with other human beings were few one day while walking down a plateau i saw a dark figure that stood waiting on the edge of a snowy mountain moor a mile distant as i approached the man waved an arm to attract my attention and when i came near enough he said by way of greeting i thought you had not seen me we were above the limits of tree growth and below and about us was a wild array of peaks and canyons when i saw you coming racing down that peak shoulder said the man i fancied that you were an escaping siberian convict sentenced for political aims what is your sentence or your service they call me the snowman i replied 
i am making winter experiments and gathering information along the summit of the continental divide i had not as yet become official colorado snow observer in answer to a counter question of mine he said oh i'm a prospector fifty-four born in ireland raised in australia and siberia am after gold in spruce gulch if i don't strike it by spring i'm off for alaska stirring reports from there it was a good place to look around several towering peaks were strangely near a number of summits reached up fourteen thousand feet into the blue sky colorado is crowded with a vast and wondrous array of mountains many of these are united by narrow plateaus that are savagely side cut with deep canyons each time i gained a commanding height i looked again and again awed by the immensity of it all at peaks and canyons with their broken strata of snow the outing as usual was all too short ten of its fourteen days were sunny and calm through two days the wind roared two other days were filled with snowstorms each day i went to some new scene i climbed one fourteen thousand foot peak i occupied one camp three nights but on each of the other nights i had a new camp most of the nights were filled with stars and always there was a blazing campfire on my way home i met a man who had heard of my winter camping habits after questioning me concerning the objects of interest seen he asked is this a good time of year for a vacation i replied a good time for a vacation is whenever you can spare the time and the very best time for a vacation in the mountains is when you can stay the longest end of chapter three